We are now live. Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Hassan Al Muazzin, and I'm bringing to you this month's guest on Talk with a Professional. My guest for tonight is Dr. Najid Kabbani. Dr. Kabbani was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He attended Peace Academy the only Islamic private school in Tulsa. After completing his associate degree at a local community college, Dr. Kabani went to earn his bachelor degree of science in biochemistry at the University of Oklahoma. After earning a bachelor degree in chemist biochemistry, he went to pursue medicine at the University of Oklahoma. When he finished his degree in medicine, he went to pursue a general surgery residency at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Peoria, Illinois. Thereafter, he pursued a fellowship in surgical endocrinology at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. In August 2021, he moved to Memphis with his wife and two children. Dr. Kabani, welcome to Talk with a Professional. Thank you, Zach Lafay, for, uh, for having me. Uh, yeah. So uh, take me back uh, to high school years and what was on the mind of uh, Majid Kabbani during high school? What was the plan then? Honestly, I didn't have a, a concrete plan at the time, but for the longest time, uh, I thought I was going to be an engineer. Uh, math came very easy to me. I had I found myself being very analytical. And so I just thought, Naturally, I just go into engineering and, and go down that path. Um, but then, you know, a couple of people suggested medicine, suggested the sciences. And so I started going that, down that path a little bit, taking some classes, and I ended up enjoying it and founding myself uh, to like it. So I continued kind of along that path. And um, that's kind of how I, I ended up first, you know, at the community college level and then at the University of Oklahoma, really really uh, enjoying that class and kind of committed to, to, to medicine as, as a career choice. So, uh, so tell me more about the transition uh, from high school to college. So you went for two years, associate degree first. Yeah. So I think um, from my standpoint, it was easier. We did already some college, college classes during high school as part of uh, Peace Academy because we were kind of, I was in the second graduating class. So we we're still new in terms of the high school years. And a lot of the traditional electives that you'd have in public school, we didn't necessarily have that. But instead of uh, what they allowed us in that time is to go and take high school, uh, college classes during high school. So when I finished high school in 2006, I had already almost had an entire year of college credits done because I had started almost a year and a half um, before within the community college. And it was an easy transition because I was already know, knew, knew the environment and things of that nature at TCC or, or Tulsa Community College. Um, so that was a little more of a natural uh, transition. It was different because I think the studying and classes were not very hard, but the environment was, was much different going from, you know, Islamic school environment to now more public, uh, space and sphere. Um, it's still, you still though have your own kind of time and schedule because the schedule is much different in college than, you know, a, a traditional seven 30 to three 30 timeframe. But, um, I think the transition from TCC to OU where now I moved away from my parents' house. I was living, me and my brother and my, one of my best friends in an apartment, big campus, you know, there's 30, 35,000 students on, on the Norman campus. That was a much bigger transition for me um, than, than initially right out of high school. Um, and those that, that really had to, that first semester was uh, a little bit of a shock until you finally, you know, got your footing right and, and, started getting a group of things and alhamdulillah it worked out well. So, so, uh, so that's interesting. So you mentioned uh, your brother and your friend. So the three of you were living together basically. Why yeah. Yeah. 
I think it's very important that, especially I, I would recommend, you know, it's, I think every situation is a little bit different, but in general, I find that it was a really good experience that our parents let us go. Now we didn't go that far away. We went, it was only two hours away from Tulsa. So every weekend we'd be able to go back every other weekend we'd go back, but having that experience of being able to live on our own and, and, and kind of the responsibility that comes with that, um, I think was very good uh, for us. And at the same time, you also, you have to have that um, relationship and brotherhood to make sure you, you kind of stay on the path and the correct path. One of the biggest things that we gravitated to right away was the MSA and, and we created a really nice brotherhood when we were at the University of Oklahoma um, that really we supported each other for those two and a half, three years that we were there. Um, because I think in, naturally human being is a social creature. So if you don't have that good kind of influence, you're going to find an influence uh, that, that'll that fill that void. So um, you really want to want to be able to to find that good influence for yourself. Alhamdulillah, a lot of the major universities now have have the MSAs and, and the Masajid uh, nearby the campus and things of that nature. Wonderful. We always stress on the support. Once you leave home and you are away from parents, you want to create your own support system. So great, you, your brother, your friends, MSA was your support. Absolutely. Away from home. So maybe we can, before we talk about the bachelor degree, maybe share with us some of the positive and the negative of being away from home, away from parents. Um, the positive is I think you start learning um, how to take responsibility for uh, your own life in a way. Um, there's no one, you know, after you telling me you have to go study, there's no one telling you go to class. There's no one telling you wake up in the morning and and, you know, get your day started. Um, it's, it's on you. So it really makes you makes you realize what you do like to do, what you don't like to do. It also makes you realize how um, I think everyone's learns a little bit differently. Um, and you kind of learn what works for you and what doesn't. Um, and it just kind of it's it gives you a bit more responsibility for your own life. And, and at the end of the day, your parents are going to be there. You're going to help you out as much as they possibly can, but you have to take your responsibility for your own kind of life and, and find a way to lead your own, your own kind of path. Very true. And also uh, you develop a sense of appreciation. Absolutely. For your mother and father and what they do. Uh, Absolutely. And you have to do everything for yourself. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can share some of the uh, challenges away from home. The challenges are, are, I think, you know, <laughs> for, uh, I think we were three, you know, three young men. So the, the living situations, the, the cooking, the cleaning, the, most of our arguments were kind of about how, how we deal with those things. So that was kind of, it was interesting and funny. And you realize you can be the best of friends, but at home you can have two, you know, very different approaches to, to how, what your, what your home life is. And, and uh, a lot of interesting arguments can come out of that. <laughs> a lot of, lot of planning and who, who does the dishes today. And who does the dishes today? You know, who, who's gonna uh, make sure the clean, whose friends are going to come over. Wait, you can't take, you know, you can't have the friends over. I have a test tomorrow. It's just interesting, you know, uh, interesting dynamics. Yes, yes. So, uh, so you decided to study. Yes. <laughs> so you decided to study biochemistry. Tell us more about biochemistry. Why biochemistry? So biochemistry, uh, for me, I thought was the you know, closest thing to give me a good start and a really strong foundation going into medical school. Um, I always enjoyed, um, I think the the biology and chemistry aspect of it. Um, I probably, you know, I think there was a few degrees offered at OU. They didn't have just a biology degree or a pre-med degree. They, you had to kind of package it. Most, most people that were going to go on the pre-med route and wanted to get a foundation in the sciences, either microbiology or kind of biochemistry. Um, biochemistry, I, I, I like the chemistry aspect of it. Again, it kind of goes a little bit more to the analytical side of my 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 brain and my thought process and that's kind of why 
I gravitated more to it to that than I did per se microbiology. Um, so now, if you reflect back, uh, since now you are in surgery, if somebody want to be in surgery, would you still recommend biochemistry or a different field? I personally think it doesn't matter too much. Um, I think uh, in all medical schools have certain classes and prerequisites that you're required to take. I will say maybe my first year of medical school was a little bit, just very a little bit easier knowing that I had those science backgrounds. But if you didn't have the extra science background, you could easily catch up in medicine. A lot of my friends in medical school were engineers. Some of them were like psychology. Some of them were even music and English majors and things of that nature. Um, and they ended up catching up and doing fine um, because, in order, you know, once you get to uh, medical school, everyone's kind of highly motivated. So, so you do okay. I think my um, recommendation, if someone were to ask me now, I would tell them do something that you like and, you know, try to find, see how committed you are to medicine, take all the prerequisite classes. If someone is kind of waffling, maybe not 100% sure, I tell them do a secondary degree that you may be able to go out and get a job if you end up realizing medicine is not for you. Uh, if someone is for sure committed, you know, and, and goes, I'm going to do medicine regardless of what, you know, how, whatever it takes, that's what I'm going to do. Then yeah, go ahead and do the sciences, uh, but make sure it's something you like. Cause at the end of the day, you're going to be studying four years for it. So um, you want to enjoy it uh, as best you can. Very, very true. Because I mean, you're going to dedicate a lot of time. So yeah. you got to enjoy it. Exactly true. Now uh, tell us a little bit about the entry into medical school. So the entry, I think for the most part is the same. The, the MCAT is the, the entrance exam. It has definitely changed since I took it. I took it, you know, that was back. I went and started medical school in 2010. So it's, it's changed in terms of the structure of it. So I can't speak too much to the new structure. Um, but that's the biggest um, hurdle in a way uh, they have to get through to get into the medical school uh, pathway. It's, uh, you take it your third, usually towards the end of your third year in undergrad. And, you know, you want to make sure you have, you know, your grades are high, your GPA is, uh, is high to be more competitive. Those are the first things you got to focus on is your grades are number one, you know, your MCAT score and studying for that. And then, if those are in line, you kind of move down the line and you start looking at community service projects, volunteering, some research um, projects, if you can fit those in. But if you have a lot of community service, volunteer and research and your grades and GPA are suffering because you're doing too much outside of the, of the classroom, that doesn't help you. That, that kind of hurts you. So you have to make sure the, the grades and the MCAT are, are, are top notch and then you kind of move down um, and prioritize those things uh, after. Absolutely. So you want to show strong academics. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. How significant is doing research for entry? I think it varies between um, medical school and medical school. Um, I think every medical school values it differently. Um, some medical schools, their goal is really not to um, they're not high on research in terms of they're just trying to get doctors into their community in that state. Uh, the more public schools, the more, you know, um, prestigious or well-known the university or medical school you're going to, of course, they're going to want research and they're going to want, but they're going to, you know, they, don't, they also want the best grades. So um, it just, it just kind of depends on what your, your aim and your goal is. I think there's some students that are, um, fit to go to those high uh, institutions, but it's really not for everyone. So I think um, it's very important to have, I think college is a good time for this, is it's kind of a moment of introspection and understanding who you are as a person and what you want to accomplish. Do you want to be, do you want to feel like I, I, you know, I, you know, some people say, well, I want to go to a big name institution and that's fine. Um, but some people say, no, that's not for me. I just want to, you know, get through it all and work day to day and, and just get, get, you know, 
uh, kind of just do, do, you know, more of the local thing. And that's perfectly fine too. So it just, you have to kind of, in a way, know yourself, know what you're willing to sacrifice because everything, regardless of what you do requires sacrifice. And the question is how much do you want to sacrifice? What do you want to sacrifice to get to those, to those goals? Thank you. This is very important for, for students in high school and in college to realize if you want to go into the medicine and you want to start this journey, it is, you're going to sacrifice a lot of time yeah. and uh, commitment. to Absolutely. To yeah. yeah. One of my, uh, when I was in medical school, one of the su surgeons I worked with, he essentially told me, if you're going to go into medicine and commit to a career in that, your 20s are going to be school. Your, your, everyone else is going to be, you know, starting their first job, starting to make some money. You're still going to be not making money in school in training. And he goes, but then you start in your thirties, really kind of thirties and then forties kind of reaping the, the benefits of that, of the work you put in your twenties. So you just, it, it is, you know, it's a long road, but I think at the end it is, of the day, it is worth it, but it does it definitely takes some, some patience. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, tell us more about the interview. What are they looking for when they interview a candidate for the College of Medicine? I think once you get to the interview process, your academics and what you have on paper, they've accepted and they like and they're okay with. At that point, they just want to make sure um, you as a person are personable. If they were going to come to you as a doctor, that there's no red flags that come out. There's, there's nothing um, that would pre prevent this guy from being able to gain someone's trust in that kind of environment. So the interview, I think um, it's very stressful for the person, but at the same time, you just want to be yourself. And they're always going to try to give you a weird question and try to throw you off and try to, it's, they're really just trying to see how you react. And a weird question is a weird question. You just answer it the best way you can and have a reason for your answer and you should be able to get through it and get past it. But really it's just more of, can I have a 10, 15, 20 minute conversation with this guy or this girl? And it kind of, and I feel comfortable with them. Can you share? I mean, what's an uncomfortable question? You, may they'll, they'll, you know, I, I, it's been a while since I've, I've done this, but they'll ask you like, it, it's random. Like if you see yourself as a shoe, what type of shoe are you? You know, <laughs> someone will ask you some crazy thing like that. And you're like, well, you know, I, I, I think I'm an athletic shoe because I like sports and, and I like being comfortable and things like that. Some people say, I think I'm a, a classy shoe because I, um, sorry, my, my daughter came in the room. Um, but so there's just questions like that, that, that really like have no, have no real reason other than to see how you react, um, react in, in a kind of a, a little bit of a pressure situation. Exactly right. I mean, they want to make sure you are mature enough to control your emotions and be also sh reflect confidence. Absolutely. So not to be intimidated uh, because as a physician, I mean, you're going to be in situations where you know, you're going to be working under severe stress. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, tell us about how was the journey into medicine? So the journey in medicine, um, I did uh, two years in uh, Oklahoma City, which is where the primary campus is. And then I decided to do my last third and fourth year back in Tulsa, where my, my parents were, um, kind of finished the journey at a branch campus there. I'd say every year is its own kind of journey. Uh, first year into medicine, you're really just starting to change your learning practices and learning habits to be able to process such high volume information in a short period of time. Um, they say, you know, typical college full time is, they say 12 to 15 hours a semester. Medical school, it's kind of on the notion of you're almost taking 25, 28 hours a semester and trying to process all that information. Um, so that's first year, just learning how do I change my habits, change my life to, to be able to study this much. Because you study that, you know, in medical school more than you've ever studied 
in your life. <laughs> um, and then second year, you get comfortable with the pace and that knowledge base. And then the big thing for second year is making sure you pass your, your step one for your board exam. Um, and that, again, I remember for a two month period, I was studying about 10 to 12 hours a day. Uh, I had a schedule down and um, it was the same thing every single day. And I'd give myself, you know, certain breaks for an hour or two here or there, but, you know, at least 10 to 12 hours a day, I was studying um, for this board exam. And then third year is when you start doing kind of clinical clerkships and get into the hospital. And then it, it totally changes because now instead of books and multiple choice questions, it's real patients and people just asking you and you have to know the answer. They're not giving you A, B or C or D. <laughs> um, and then at the same time, you're also trying to figure out, well, where do I fit in? Because every specialty has a personality, has a little different structure. And you kind of want to see where do I feel most comfortable? Where do I fit in with the people around me? Um, and what type of work do I do? And sometimes that's hard because some of the rotations are just two weeks while others are, you know, six to eight weeks. So it, it does take some soul searching, a lot of guidance and mentorship and, and to work with at the same time to be able to pick the, or the right specialty because fourth year, you know, the beginning of fourth year is where the match process and everything happens. And um, you want to make sure you're fully prepared for that. Thank you. So uh, can you also share with us, I mean, uh, when, when do people decide medicine is not for me? Have you seen people just given up in the first year or two? I have seen, uh, I've, I know of um, a few people that, again, there was, there was some, a, per, a person that the first semester when he realized I'm studying this much, he had actually done an engineering degree. So he realized, well, I don't need to, you know, I, I can't handle this and just left and took an engineering job and sad medicine was not for him. <laughs> I know of a few people that finished their degree and then decided you know, I don't really like clinical medicine and they kind of tangent into either public health or some other thing where healthcare related, but not necessarily clinical, uh, clinical medicine and things of that nature. I think it's, it goes back to um, making sure you're doing medicine for the right reasons. I think when people tell me they, they want to do it for some, I've heard people tell me they want to do it for the money or they want to do it just for, to feel respected because it's this, you know, I think in the, in the Arab world, we have this notion of you're a doctor. So there's prestige around that. Um, I tell those people it's not, it's not worth it if that's your reason, because you can make money in a lot of different professions and even more money than, than a, as you would as a doctor uh, without the, as much, as much work and sacrifice that you put in to be a doctor. So you really have to do it for the right reasons. Um, either, you know, the love of the field the being able to being, you know, wanting to make sure you're helping patients and helping people and, um, and, and making sure that you have the right motivations to get through it. Cause on those, on those hard days where you're putting in 10, 12 hours of studying, you have to make sure you're doing it cause you like it. You're doing it cause you want to get to the end of it. Not, you know, you can only do something so long for uh, a sort of title or tag and I don't think it's worth it. And those, those people are usually the ones that realize it's not for them. And I think in the U S it's a little bit of an issue because it, it can be a problem because our medical schools, all medical schools are expensive, even the public medical schools. So once you put invest that much money and then you say, I don't want to do it, you're really putting yourself in a really bad situation uh, from a financial standpoint. Uh, so you really kind of want to going back into those college years of soul searching of knowing why you want to do something, making sure it's right for you. Right. Right. Uh, thank you. I mean, this is very useful. Uh, so, uh, so our viewers, I mean, if somebody interested in medicine, make sure you are really prepared academically, you enjoy studying, you have the stamina to sit down and study for six, seven hours, 12 hours uh, without feeling uh, depressed or, I mean, it's not simple. It's not easy to sit down for 12 hours and study. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so you wanna learn how to manage your time, make sure you have a support system and you're focused. Mm -hmm. 
focused, yeah. So, so when you finished medicine, uh, what was on your mind? What, what area of specialty you wanted to pursue? I, I knew I wanted, so I going into medicine knew I didn't want to do internal medicine. There was a lot of doctors in our community that were internal medicine and they were great people, but I, I shadowed them a few times as in my process and in going into, into medical school and things of that nature. And, and I realized just internal medicine was really not for me. Um, I wanted something a little bit more hands-on than just, you know, giving someone a pill and hoping they get better and things of that nature. And, that, and I'm not trying to downplay it, but that's not all they do. But, but in general, I kind of knew I didn't want to go into the, the, the medicine field of things. So I, I kind of went at it with an open mind. That was really my only thing. And I found myself during those clinical clerkships uh, really gravitating toward being in the operating room. Um, I like more so the ability to treat a problem and see a result uh, in a short period of time. You know, someone comes with a problem, you operate on them, they get better, uh, you know, within a week or so, uh, a lot of times less, sometimes a couple of days, and, and you actually see that result and you see the benefits. So that gravitated towards me. I also really liked working with my hands and, and kind of doing um, I tell people that, that I, I got that from my dad. My dad loves this kind of a do it yourself, uh, do it yourself handyman. So we, he's built everything in our house <laughs> so that I, you know, I, I, I enjoyed working with my hands. I also am in just in my nature, I'm more of an introvert type person and I like working and, but not having to, um, be in clinic all the time and just seeing, you know, 15, 20 patients a day and just talking, talking, talking. Um, so I, I think the operating room for me was actually very, uh, very comfortable. And um, I found a lot of peace in, in the operating room, just being able to kind of work and in a way the patients asleep and I have to necessarily talk to them right away. Um, but uh, so that's, that's what I think. I think I saw, I, I saw that lifestyle, I saw that process, and I found myself being able to kind of fit in the, in there. And one of the things I tell the the medical students that were behind me, and when I was a resident, they would ask me, well, how do you know, you know, what what advice can you give me to for what career path? And I tell them, don't look at the residents, look at the attending lifestyle or the doctor when he's done and see if you if that's the lifestyle you want. Because no matter what field you go into, residency is going to be tough. It's going to be hard. You're going to, again, however many years each specialty is, uh, you're going to you're going to be working really hard for all those years. So uh, you can't base it on 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 just that residency. You want to look at what does life look like after you're done, and see if that's something for you. Right. So uh, you mentioned. I mean, you like to do things with your hand. Uh, but also, I mean, surgery, I mean, for many of us, uh, uh, not knowing much about surgery, I mean, it's not easy to see somebody cutting, making an incision, blood, et cetera. So how, how would you manage all this? Yeah, it's funny because when I was a kid, every time a you know, bloody scene would come on TV and those medical shows, I'd actually leave the room because I'd, I'd get lightheaded and didn't like seeing the blood or anything like that. Um, I think when I got into the actual clerkship, I realized patients asleep, they can't, they can't feel anything. And then you, you cover them up in a way where it, 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 it kind of looks, you're just kind of working in your little square of the, you know, part of body that you're working on. So that, um, became a little bit easier to, to kind of handle and manage. And then you realize there's a lot of fine technique and, 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 um, to surgery that it's not really a bloody mess or anything that's kind of portrayed on TV and things of that nature. So, um, over time, uh, it got, you know, it, it becomes uh, kind of second nature and, and as a part of the training process and things of like that nature, I still don't, I, pr I still prefer when they're asleep and not feeling anything in awake than if doing something on someone that's awake and can respond to you and tell you, Oh, that hurts. And, 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 and things of that nature. But uh, it's kind of a, it's definitely not for everyone. Some people just hate being in the operating room and can't, can't really take in, can't really stomach in. And that's perfectly fine. 
Um, I'm glad there's people that do all these different specialties because the things I like to do, people don't like to, some people don't like to do, and they like to do things that I don't like to do. So, you know, alhamdulillah, there's, there's something for everyone. Right. So, uh, I mean, if, if somebody, let's say in medicine and interested in surgery, can you share with us the training in surgery, the first residency? Yeah. So surgery residency for general surgery, well, all surgical subspecialties are, uh, five years in training. I think that's different than, uh, most internal medicine or uh, is three years. So you're adding two more years. Um, but most internal medicine fellowships are usually two or three years. Some are just one. And then, but most surgical fellowships are usually just one or two. So at the end of the day, if you're planning to do fellowship and go beyond, it ends up kind of evening out and you're, everyone's doing about sometimes five to six years of training anyways. So I wouldn't let the number of training years dissuade anyone if that's what you're interested in. Um, but surgical training is, is five years long. Oh, excuse me. Um, you, the first year is kind of you're learning how to take care of patients in the hospital. Um, the second year, you're learning how to take patients in the ICU a lot. Um, the third and fourth year, you're learning how to really kind of operate and start learning how to operate. Uh, you kind of grow that experience as it goes through more so. And then the fifth year, you're trying to transition between, you know, operating with uh, an attending surgeon to trying to learn how to operate independently. Because uh, the goal is to, after five years, you can do it on your own. Um, but, but, you know, surgery training is probably one of the toughest residencies out there. You're routinely working 80 hours a week. Um, I spent five years essentially just having four days off a month. And, and you kind of, uh, it does take away from being able to do a lot of other activities. I, I'm not, you know, I don't want to downplay um, it's tough. I tell, you know, you wake up early in the morning. I, I used to set my alarm, you know, sometimes four, four thirty in the morning, get to the hospital by five 30. And every morning I, I, I hated getting up, but when I finally got to the hospital, I enjoyed the work and I enjoyed being there and, and doing what, what I did, but you know, you're routinely doing 12 hours a day, uh, in terms of the shift. So it's definitely, um, uh, definitely takes sacrifice and time and, and a commitment to it. And, and I think it's, it's absolutely necessary because there's not many specialties where you come into someone's life, you have a five to 10 minute conversation with them and they agree to let you put them completely to sleep and do something, you know, cut them open. And in a way, surgeries, you have to hurt someone in order to help them. So you're making this big incision, you're making, these cuts on their body and you're hurt, you're causing them pain, but the goal is to give them relief from their problem down the line. Uh, so I think it's important that it has those extra years of training. I think it's important that you put in all those hours because there's nothing that can really replace the patient experience. Um, and, and the more patients you see, the more you're going to learn, the more you're going to be able to recognize the patterns uh, come with it and, and recognize what you need to do to solve the, the problems that you're going to encounter. And then obviously learning the technical aspects and, and the steps of each surgery and how you do this and how you do that and, and things of that nature. Um, so definitely uh, uh, one of the harder residencies, but uh, I think very rewarding if you're going into it for the right reasons. Right. So, so during the first five years, uh... You are associated with the surgeon. I mean, you always yeah, work with the surgeon. With the university uh, program or hospital, essentially, and you're and you're working under the hand of uh, of a of sur a group of surgeons, usually uh, more than just uh, one to, to in that program, and and you're working under their guidance and and tutelage uh, to 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 kind of learn learn the craft. So would they, I mean, are you allowed to do anything on your own during the operation or just observe? No, you definitely are. You start off by uh, assisting. Uh, in order to learn to operate, you have to first learn to assist. That's uh, one of the first rules of surgery. Uh, so you learn all surgery. It doesn't matter how good a surgeon is. It takes more than two hands. Um, a lot of times they get something done, especially a lot of the bigger things. 
Um, so you learn how to assist, you learn how to help um, that, and then you kind of graduate. The more you do, then you turn into, okay, you learn how to be the primary operating surgeon and, and your attending who's teaching you kind of switches. He becomes your assistant. He's still guiding you, you know, telling you to do this, do that, be careful here. And, and as you show that you know what you're doing, you grow into, okay, now you're doing it. And he's not saying as much because he knows you know what you're doing. He's still watching and paying attention. And as you get to that end of your fourth year, fifth year, you're kind of, you've shown that you can do the entire surgery on your own. And now you have the responsibility of teaching that younger surgeon that's in his first or second year. And that's really the, the ultimate goal because to prove the one number one proof of knowing how to do an operation is if you can teach it to someone else. Um, so that's really the goal. Every surgery program is structured a little bit differently. Some have more hands-on in terms of in those five years being able to operate independently. Some um, are a little bit more where the attending is still more hands-on and you still, um, you know, you don't get as much um, time to really those last years to hone your skills. And you'll see that those uh, programs will tend to have more fellows there. And so the opportunity for the actual resident may be a little bit less. And those programs tend to push their graduates into fellowship rather than into practice right away. Um, but, but yeah, you definitely, there's plenty of things that um, towards, you know, you have to, you have to prove that you can do it and then they'll let you do it on your own, even as a resident. Um, at the end of the day, they still, you know, they still assume the liability and the responsibility of making sure everything goes appropriately. Um, and that's, you know, they trust also the person that if they have, a, if something comes up where you're not hundred percent sure they're right there to help and answer the question or, or help guide you. Um, but on some of the more simpler things, uh, I've definitely been able to do things kind of by myself, knowing that, you know, my attending is available or uh, my attending is comfortable knowing he's done this 20, 30 times. So yeah, I'm comfortable with him doing it uh, by himself. So basically you start by doing small segments and then you, you go up the ladder until you are doing the, almost everything on your own. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So when you finish the residency, what kind of surgery you can do? So a general surgeon, um, you kind of think about it, anything from your chin almost all the way down to like your knee. <laughs> um, there's obviously nuance and areas that when you're talking about in the abdomen, uh, where I think it requires subspecialty training. Um, but your goal is to be comfortable with the anatomy to, to be able to do most operations in that area. Um, and then also a little bit depends on what program you're in and what the surgeons that in your program, um, have their specialty and expertise in there's minimum requirements in every category and every type of surgery. Um, some programs just barely beat the minimum on that surgery, but then in other areas they have way over. An example is in my program in residency, we didn't really have a strong endocrine program. So I just got the bare minimum cases to graduate, <clears throat> but like colorectal surgery and, and hernia surgery, we did a lot of that. So my numbers were almost two or three times the required minimum in that category. Um, so, so that's kind of most uh, in general, most everything in the abdomen we learn how to take care of most things in the, in the chest, but that's a, as part of a thoracic surgery experience. And as you get into practice, most people, most general surgeons kind of don't practice any kind any surgery in the chest because it goes to thoracic surgery, which is more of a fellowship tract. So, so, so typically how many fellowships in, in surgery are there? I think there's about, um, seven maybe more so there's there's endocrine surgery there is breast surgery fellowship there's surgical oncology which really is uh liver pancreas 
focused. It does a lot of other things in terms of um, other uh, weird soft tissue tumors, sarcomas and things, a lot of oncology, oncologic surgery, but they're also kind of a hepatobiliary surgery at the same time. There's transplant surgery, um, there's plastic surgery, there's cardiac uh, surgery and then thoracic surgery. Some programs are do a little bit of both uh, in terms of cardiothoracic, but really as, as the field has expanded, they've kind of gone on to their own cardiac and thoracic tracks. Um, and I, I think that's, I think, oh, and there's also vascular surgery uh, as, as uh, out of general surgery. So all those, all those fellowship opportunities so how did you, why did you pick up endocrinology surgery? So I always liked the, one of the first surgeries that I did that kind of drew, that kind of uh, led me down the path was thyroid and parathyroid surgery, which is uh, in the neck. And I love the anatomy that we have in the neck, just the way it was more, um, you had to have more finesse and fine detail. And, and I thought that suited my personality and I, I was kind of intrigued by that and I liked that there was still a little medicinal aspect in terms of the hormones and understanding how they all come together and work together um, and so I always kind of gravitated towards uh, endocrine surgery as a fellowship and at the same time most of the operations patients do very well they usually go home the next day they don't spend a lot of time in the hospital so Definitely after you get into it, you start thinking about lifestyle choices and what kind of surgeries do I want to do um, and how do I want to, my life to look like after I'm done. Uh, so that definitely plays a role uh, also. So maybe help our viewers, Dr. Kabani, uh, when you talk about endocrinology, what, what glands fall under endocrinology? So endocrine surgery, we focus on uh, the thyroid gland, which is in your neck, your parathyroid gland, which are four glands, uh, each one sitting on behind the back of your thyroid. Can you uh, play with us the functions? So people yeah, so your, your thyroid is, is huge in terms of just overall metabolic uh, process in your body. The way I think of it is if you're hyperthyroid, where you have a lot of hormone, your body is kind of on overdrive um, and functioning that way to where, you know, you're going to lose a lot of weight. You're going to, your heart's going to be racing. You're going to have diarrhea. You can feel like hot and sweaty all the time. The opposite, if your thyroid hormone is low, then your body is kind of almost kind of in the really quiet, slow, slow process where your heart's beating slow. You're constipated. You feel tired all the time. Um, if you're cold and clammy, um, and things of that nature, not there, the, the surgical aspects of it, um, more so on the hyperthyroid part and then also the thyroid cancer uh, part is where surgery comes in so there's definitely aspects that go more towards your traditional endocrinologist and then uh, they can kind of refer you to the surgical approach if needed your parathyroid really is regulates the calcium level in your body and sometimes when it's hyper functioning you can get high calcium levels and uh, that that requires uh, surgery to, as a, as a cure for the, for the disease process, where most of the time you end up taking out one of the glands that's hyperfunctioning. Uh, the other one is your adrenal glands in your abdomen. Um, we have two of them that sit above the kidneys. Uh, they create, they, uh, secrete a lot of the hormones. Uh, the main ones, uh, being our, uh, testosterone, uh, epinephrine, uh, you have, uh, those, those are kind of your stress hormones. And then obviously the testosterone and, and estrogen are sex hormones. And then the, um, aldosterone, which is can control your, your sodium potassium levels and also your blood pressure. And then, and then cortisol, which is also a stress hormone. But, uh, if they're, if they have hyper secretion in some of those hormones, they can cause disease processes where the treatment is taking out the gland. Um, and then the lastly is sometimes in the pancreas or in your small bowel, you have tumors that are neuroendocrine tumors that they can also secrete hormones and that can uh, sometimes require surgical treatment. So those are really the, the, the areas that we focus on 
uh, in endocrine surgery. The large, vast majority of it is thyroid and parathyroid as one and two, and then adrenal is number three. Neuroendocrine tumors are, are, are rare in general, which is a good thing. Um, and, but if they, they do, uh, present in someone, then definitely, um, need to be looked at and evaluated for potential surgery. Not all of them require it, but, but definitely, uh, something we work on. So in this area, do we have a adult versus pediatric or is just, uh, everything's grouped together? No, you definitely have uh, a difference. There's a lot of, um, genetic and syndromes that will present um, with different uh, at earlier ages in the pediatric population that sometimes need to be intervened on um, earlier, uh, especially with the thyroid and the pancreas, uh, even actually the adrenal glands and, and the parathyroid, just depending on some genetic syndromes, you can definitely see it in kids too. So, I mean, uh... So even now, once you finish surgery and specialty, I mean, when do you take the license exam? So you take it after you finish residency. I actually took my licensing exam during my fellowship year uh, in Cleveland. Um, And it's a little bit different than the medicine because there is an oral component to it. So uh, internal medicine, like everything else, you take a test, you know, four or five hour long test and multiple questions. Um, But then there's a... Uh, oral component where there's an oral component where um, you are asked by another surgeon they give you scenarios and cases and you have to respond telling them what you would do and how you would solve the certain problem um, so that that is different than the medicine world where they don't usually have that component uh, so, so basically you have to take an oral exam maybe a written exam for the specialty in surgery yeah. Right. Do they yes. require hours? Do they require hours before you give you the license? No, they don't require hours, but there's a uh, maintenance of certification, they call it, where every three years you have to have a certain number of uh, med- continuing medical education or CME hours. And it's in order to maintain the license that you have. Uh, and so you have to prove that you're staying up to date on, on certain things in the field uh, in order to maintain your license. Great. So, uh, so Dr. Kabani, uh, what advice do you have for people who want to go into medicine and surgery? Um, very broad question, but I, th- you know, I think number one, I tell patients, uh, not sorry, not patients. I tell s- people that want to go into uh, surgery, medicine, and ju- medicine. First off, is make sure you're committed to it. Make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, there's, if you like healthcare, there's a lot of different fields that are not just medicine and medical school that I think are not, um, uh, made popular or just not well known, uh, to people out there. Sometimes it's that people think it's just medicine or, or, or nothing in healthcare. Um, but obviously find, you know, find someone that's in the field, sit down, talk to them, ask them your questions. Once you commit to it, know that it's a long path. For me personally, it was when I graduated high school in 2006, and I just started my uh, first year out of training in 2021. So that's, what, 16 years, 15 years, 15 years of training uh, until you you finally get to your first real job. Um, So it's a long path, but uh, at the same time, you know, it's worth it once you, once you get to the end and uh, you end up making up the lost productivity and whatnot uh, in those years that, that you put into it. Uh, in terms of surgery, I think you have to be um, highly motivated to want to do uh, kind of that field. You have to be able to be comfortable under pressure. You want to be able to do, you know, with you make, quick decisions and kind of move forward, uh, with with the process. And you want to make sure, like I said, you're comfortable with the work environment and the type of work that you're doing, uh, being in the operating room and, and, um, also the kind of the lifestyle that comes with it. Sometimes you do get called in the middle of the night and you have to go to the hospital at 11, 10 o'clock at night to do an emergency surgery that's necessary. Um, but, 
uh, you know, those are kind of broad and big picture advice, but uh, it, it's definitely worth it. It's great uh, kind of rewarding uh, career path. I think one of the things that drew me towards surgery is also, I think in, in our, in the Muslim community, there's much more medicine doctors than there are surgeons. So that was something for me that, you know, something that I could provide to, to the Muslim community is having that um, surgical aspect and bringing that expertise and knowledge to back to our community. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kambani. Uh, uh, very intriguing. And to our viewers, uh, thank you for being with us. Today we had a discussion on the career of Dr. Kambani in uh, endocrinology surgery. Uh, hopefully next month we'll see you with another episode. We'll talk with a professional. Thank you. And um, good month. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Dr. Lafayette for having me. And if anyone has any questions or wants any more specific advice, feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm here in the Memphis community uh, and always willing to, to, to chat. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Salam alaikum.